What's not, I think, known to anyone because it's still surprising to me is what aspects of what I'm trying to teach about how Tesla operates are shocking to these established major players. One way to determine which of the auto manufacturers are going to succeed in this rapidly changing revolution to electric vehicles is to evaluate them based on their speed of innovation and how well they're able to respond to challenges. Which of the car companies will survive? Which of the pure play electric vehicle companies like Tesla, Lucid, Rivian, the Chinese car manufacturers, or the various legacy OEM companies like Ford, GM, Toyota, are going to be able to adjust to the new EV paradigm? Today, we'll be talking to an expert in change management, someone who's worked at both Tesla and Toyota, and who consults regularly with large corporations to find out what are the ways Tesla runs their business that is critical to their success. We have Joe Justice back with us again. Welcome, Joe. Really appreciate you joining me. My pleasure, Herbert. Thanks for having me all the way from Japan. Oh, wonderful. So Joe is an ex-employee at Tesla, where he ran the Agile program division. He has also worked with Bill Gates at Microsoft, the leadership team at Amazon and Toyota. He's written a book called Scrum Master and founded Wikispeed. I've had a chance to interview Joe last year when he shared how Tesla's speed of innovation is what really matters to the future valuation of the company. All right, as always, Joe, please help me get brighter. All right, so Joe, thank you very much as always. Appreciate this. And um, thank you for calling in from Japan. So first question I wanna ask you is, what is in your mind the number one thing that makes Tesla different uh, versus any of the car companies? What, what very, versus other companies in general? What would you say the answer is? What I've learned since we've spoken last and haven't yet gone into any detail with anybody mm-hmm. is uh, since retiring two years ago, I teach classes for fun. I mean, I, I retired, I, was finan- mm-hmm. I am financially in- independent, but I realized I really like work. Um, teaching what I think I learned about how Tesla operates has shown me what's surprising to everyone else. Uh, so I was in Airbus two weeks ago in Hanover, and they've allowed that to be public. Um, and then working with Mercedes-Benz before that, and they've posted that publicly. Thank you, Mercedes-Benz. And then continuing to work with Toyota, I'll be in Toyota City in four days, um, working with some leadership there. Uh, but then online um, with Toyota this whole time, and then in person before covid What's not, I think, known to anyone, because it's still surprising to me, is what aspects of what I'm trying to teach about how Tesla operates are shocking to these established major players. And I think by making a contrast, people will understand how different the Musk companies are better than just saying the Musk companies use digital self-management. Well, how does that compare to Airbus? Um, how does that compare to Mercedes-Benz? What what are they using? And I don't want to blow up trade secrets, but I can say what those companies publicly say. And Mm -hmm. I I think the, the gap is massive. The speed of innovation is the result. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. It's probably the nano management Musk announcing 10 days ago, uh, all hires and tests have to go through Musk. What company of 150,000 people would do that, especially when their CEO has five other major companies, depending on how you count the companies? Um, The nano management from the chief engineer seems to matter, that level of passion. The result seems to be product introduction coming with more innovation in it than any other company has seen in a decade. And we hear this from their battery refining folks, people in cathode development saying they haven't seen this much change in the cathode development industry in 20 years. And as they've seen in Tesla in the last 18 months, uh, every aspect of the vehicle and of the energy products, uh, pace of innovation continues to seem to be the only thing that matters in the long run. Mm -hmm. Now, so you've worked at Toyota And they're famous for their agile methodology for 70, you know, since 1970s, they've perfected it. And then you've applied agile to Tesla. How are they different? Is it the same 
same history, same thing, what it is now, or is it a very different animal, what it is today versus uh, what Toyota is still doing? I haven't seen anything like what the Musk companies are doing anywhere. So, so about this aspect, the Numi plant in California, which is now Tesla's Fremont plant. And when I worked there in 2020, that was the global headquarters. That same building had been operated by Toyota before. And that same building was operated by General Motors before that. Some of the same people still work there, uh, working with lean at Tesla. Some of those employees worked in lean at Toyota before that and lean at GM before that. And this building is an interesting case study. You have some of the same employees, you have the same concrete and asphalt and steel, and the output of that building has been dramatically different under those three management types. There are books written like the machine that changed the world for one on when Toyota took the building from GM, mm -hmm. kept many of the same people, changed the management style and cost per vehicle went dramatically down. This event and other events like it in the eighties were so famous the word lean and Toyota production system became popular. Why is it that Toyota would take the same facility with some of the same employees and produce what customers considered equivalent cars? General Motors would say our cars are unique and can't be compared. And Toyota would also say our cars are unique and can't be compared, but customers would cross shop some of the models. Customer comparative cars cost less to make when Toyota made them in the same plant with some of the same people. And Toyota was doing that all around the world at the time and continues to do so. When Toyota makes a customer equivalent car, it costs them less. Their profit margin is higher than when BMW does, when Mercedes Benz mm -hmm. does, when Seat does, go to Ford. So this is why Lean became famous. Last year, Q3, Tesla's posted, they make $9,500 per car, eight, times as much as Toyota. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's remember what the business case for lean was. This, the reason Toyota became famous, the reason people started learning Japanese words, what is it that's working? Is it Hansei? Is it Kaizen? Like people really start trying to figure it out. That business model has been not only surpassed, it's been destroyed. And I don't think many people realize how different a beast Tesla is. Um, but as many mathematicians say, exponential growth is not so natural for the human brain to, to mm -hmm. see or be aware of it, 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 it rises when a wave rises exponentially in front of someone, it's very surprising. Uh, it, it's the human brain doesn't deal with that naturally so perfectly unless they study the phenomena regularly. And Tesla is on what seems to still be an exponential ramp growth. And we're only seeing that speed up with plants around the world. So the difference between Toyota Lean and Tesla Agile, as I'll call it, is a cost to manufacture that is now a difference of eight times. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So. So, you know, so Tesla or sorry, Toyota has been known to do change management, to be really focused on improvements, and yet they've fallen behind. Many are saying that they're actually probably the kind of like really far behind compared to every other car company making this change. They had to let go of uh, Toyota, the grandson, and uh, bring in new management. Why? of all the companies, why were they the last to change? Is it that because they've done so much change for a very specific, you know, production line and they can't even consider a brand new different paradigm, uh, or is it, um, just a culture situation or what, what was this? Toyota, not so many years ago was led by the owner. The owner was also the executor. And in some ways they were like the Elon Musk of their time. They introduced some, some really powerful concepts that at, at the time were a radical use of machinery. One is you would have machines continue to make the same thing, 
but automatically stop once they detected certain types of defects. That level of automation or automation was incredibly advantageous in volume production. Interestingly, modern types of automation and automation seem to be coming from software native companies, agile native companies, and we're not having the same type of visionaries outside of the software industry. I'm teaching courses all over the world now. I, I just got back from working with Airbus in Hanover. They're making the A3D, A321 XLR. It's this relatively narrow airplane, a single lane airplane, and the entire bottom belly instead of cargo is this massive fuel tank. And what that allows this traditionally engineered plane in some ways to do is go from small airport to small airport halfway around the world. So suddenly tiny airports can offer international flights and what people before thought of as budget airlines like Indi um, like um, Star or Peach uh, can suddenly offer long haul international flights uh, still coming from their smaller airports or smaller terminals and smaller jetways. Uh, and this is proving to be a very interesting success for Airbus. What's shocking is how long these programs continue to take at non-agile native companies. These are five to 15 year programs, three years to have a significant amount of engineering change approved. Um, and a lot of non-owner executive led companies are acting the same way. Then we join mob teams or group work teams out of Silicon Valley originally is where it was popularized. Um, although there's some kids in Finland that were doing an earlier version like in the 90s. So, so we can't really pin the origin of, of that type of group work of flash mob development, mob development. But these folks are creating, they're really, really fast. And this is normal in a company like Tesla, a digitally native company, and completely alien to just about anybody else. But I like to think that in the very early days of Toyota, the Toyota execs, for example, would have felt inspired and adopted it immediately. But when we separate the owners from the executives, there seems to be an inability to make large change quickly, um, a resistance to it. And people intentionally install skills groups. This group handles mechanical engineering. I won't interfere with it. This group handles software engineering. I won't interfere with it. This group handles procurement. That's not my group. I won't interfere with it. And that makes ripple effect changes effectively impossible. Whereas when you have a, an owner executive like Elon Musk is, who nano manages, who is actually aware of these different domains, changes across domain can be done in seconds. And I'd like to take this back to how this group work happens. One person is driving, they're working on the thing, they're welding or writing software or emailing the supplier. Another person is automating that. They're using drag and drop code or they're programming robots and they're helping add automation to whatever's being done. So they're scripting the email, if it's an email or the procurement contract, or they're robotically assisting the weld, or they're automating the x-ray of the weld to check for defects. So you have someone automating, they're not doing the work, they're automating it. You have someone else giving instruction. The driver very often gets lost in the detail of the tool. For example, if you're welding, is the gas flowing correctly? Do I, am I still using the right kind of gas? Am I getting the right temperature on both sides of what I'm doing? And the navigator is reminding what's the value of what we're trying to do to keep the driver fast and efficiently focused on the business value. Then so that's three people. Now you have someone automating, someone driving and someone navigating. Hopefully you have two more. <laughs> and what those other two people are doing is they're updating the AI tools 
to automate everything the humans are doing. So you have your physical automator, your auto machinist, and they're doing scripts if it's software or basically script on robots if it's robots. And then you have the assisted folks working with different types of AI stacks, asking Autobidder, is this the best price? Uh, training Tesla Vision, can we label this type of weld, this type of weld defect? Auto labeler, do you understand this type of weld defect? So when we feed you x-ray video, you can flag these defects quickly. As a result, this group of three to five people at the speed of one person doing the work has automated and tested the work and it can continue without humans thereafter. I, I teach this now and the expressions on people's faces at all of the world's major companies is a mix of horror and excitement <laughs> because they realize as fast as they can do work, their work has been oftentimes better than they were doing it now, taken over from them. And most of these people have a job identity tied to, I do this type of work. And that job identity was automated away from them about as fast as they did it one time, nearly. And if your sense of value doesn't come from your ability to learn new things, <laughs> or uh, then it, it, it's horror. And because I see such shock and awe when this technique is used in every other company has let me see a, a mirror again, how radically different the must companies operate as a norm as a normal way of operating. And now it makes more sense how even in some cases, some of the same employees that were in the same facility under General Motors and later Toyota, how they have so much higher pace of output and cost reduction and the fundamental business mechanics, rate, quality, um, uh, customer satisfaction. The rate of those metrics climbing out of Tesla is ADEX, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting to 10X, we're within rounding error of 10X, of anyone, uh, in, including the most established players, which previously were Volkswagen and Toyota. And now it makes sense when the work style is so alien and then often so resisted because these people say, well, what do we do with our management, which is 60% of headcount in most of these companies, 60%. What do we do with our management who is not used to doing engineering anymore? In some cases never did, mm -hmm. but at least not used to doing engineering anymore. If management is now replaced by digital self-management. And I say, well, I would ask you to try to do what Elon does attempt to be a model contributor, join these mobs doing the best engineering you can. And a lot of these people don't want to go back to work. I like how Elon Musk calls it the laptop class and how the laptop mm -hmm. class is totally out of touch with reality. I, <laughs> I think the stubbornness of, of some of these people is going to make for a hard landing for their company instead of a soft landing or even a launch pad. Nice. Okay. So, um, you're, so you, you've, you've, Last time we spoke, you talked about the speed of innovation. And right now you're just giving even more specific exactly what's happening. Give great examples. And some people were saying that Tesla, they believe is five to seven years ahead, a generation ahead. Uh, when I interviewed Corey Steuben, he's uh, with Monroe and Associates. He said that they were five to seven years ahead. But the last several years, the Model 3 and Model Y specifically, haven't really improved so much other than the, the Giga castings and cost improvements. Um, it allowed the other car manufacturers to catch up a few years. But now with the unboxed process that they've introduced, that's going to even separate even further. Tesla's continue to separate. Is, is your view, though, that because of what you just talked about, the way that the entire company is structured, how individual teams contribute, how mob um, groups work together, that this is continuously accelerating the separation between the other competitors or how do you, do you, do you how do you uh, compare to what he just said? 
The KPIs that run the company are, are some fundamentals like rate, quality, customer satisfaction, which is measured indirectly by customer returns, um, primarily, primarily measured indirectly by customer returns. The rate at which those KPIs are improving, which these are the fundamental mechanics for a business in the, in the sector that Tesla is in, those numbers only continue to ramp. If you're looking for uh, flashy product debuts, I would say Tesla has fallen behind in flashy product debuts. In exchange, Tesla's focused on the underlying business mechanics at a rate of improvement that no one is even close to. The rate at which the rate, the, the amount of production is growing in Tesla is higher than anyone uh, by a very, very large margin. Uh, in fact, as, as Elon has attempted to make the case, there's never been a hard good company of any type, light bulbs, washing machines, sewing machines, vacuum cleaners, any hard goods company ever that's grown as fast as Tesla. And Tesla is sustaining that growth. In fact, it's, it's accelerating. And depending on how you measure software licenses, there's not even been a software company that's grown as fast as Tesla. That is where these teams are focusing their incredible power is ramping the rate, the quality and the customer satisfaction as measured by rate of returns. The returns continues to drop ahead of anyone else. Now, what's easier to get excited about is something like the unbox process. The only reason the unbox process exists is because it dramatically improves rate quality, and then that should then affect customer perceived value. Tesla doesn't do engineering for engineering's sake. There are companies that do really cool, flashy things. Um, famously, when Jobs, um, mm -hmm. Steve Jobs created, um, oh, this was a while ago. There were like these small supercomputers. What was that? NEX? Um, oh. Next. Next. Yeah, and, and it and didn't sell well, tragically. Mm -hmm. um, the factory was designed to be beautiful. The product, if you took it apart, was beautiful. The focus was on the elegance of it, but not its core spec. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and it was, it was non-competitive uh, in, in, in the long run and, and ultimately didn't succeed as a business. The, the Musk companies do create very inspiring engineering in order to ramp rate quality customer perceived value. Uh, so I think when people, when, when you have deeply talented teams like at Monroe and Associates, uh, when they're examining the engineering through a teardown and their elaborate analysis of a teardown, they will be able to detect awesome things like the octo valve very, very quickly. They'll be able to detect awesome things like the unbox process, which pieces of it were introduced even in 2020. That's the reason the mega casting and giga casting were able to attach to the rest of the car is because it's a fundamentally modular system at a different level than BMW, Mercedes, Skoda, Ford is. And you can change the rear third of the car, which you can't in other other vehicles. The body in white is a unit. Um, but what they might not be able to appreciate immediately is the very, very small changes made multiple times an hour that save a second in production, save a gram of vehicle or system weight, save a milliwatt of power draw that continue to compound, 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 and create the exponential growth curve. Tesla published, so you don't have to just take my word for it. Tesla published as the rate of completed vehicles increases out of Giga Shanghai and Giga and Fremont, Fremont, Nevada, uh, Fremont, California, the labor hours per vehicle drops. Why is that? Why is that? because they're automating production of the same design? No, because the rate of part change is increasing. It's because they're automating the rate of changing part, of innovating new part, which is 
completely different than the way hard goods companies anywhere else around the world operate. And that's what a lean analysis, someone thinking from a Toyota production system standpoint, wouldn't even see. Uh, they wouldn't be even measuring the rate of part change. They'd be attempting to measure cost to manufacturer only, or time to manufacturer only, or tacked time only. Uh, most of them aren't even measuring factory density. And factory density is the primary gain of the unbox process. Yes, it's 30% faster and 30% cost reduction, which is insane. But the primary gain is a 40% increase in factory density, operational density, effective use, utilization of the factory, which for all of Monroe Associates credit, and I have absurd amounts of respect for them, I don't think they'd be even measuring um, engineering changes that would lead to factory density. Then most of us mm -hmm. on the outside, if it looks good on Instagram, we know to clap. So if a company unveils a really beautiful concept, we know to clap. That That's cool. That's beautiful. How would we know if something that looks arguably the same as the Model Y before is 30 seconds less to manufacture and $30 or rupees or yen or RMB less to manufacture? And that's what drives rate quality and customer perceived value. This year, the major drop on customer perceived value, the major increase for customer perceived value for Tesla is lowering price, uh, which is a direct benefit of the first two metrics, rate and quality. So if you have your most talented people working with your best assisted tools in production, affecting rate and quality, the business fundamentals grow beyond anyone else. That said, Tesla is way overdue for a sexy concept on Veil or a transition of a previous concept to production because, yeah, Instagram still matters. <laughs> okay. And then, so, uh, appreciate that. Now, I'm going to jump to something I was going to reserve to much later in the conversation, but we're talking about uh, improving the cost, improving the efficiency, um, and, and just things that are in the invisible in the factory. What are you thinking about the Tesla bots? And um, is it really far down the line from your understanding of how quickly Tesla can create products? We've seen the bot just kind of introduced, still kind of dangling with a tether to now being able to walk on its own in a matter of a year and then being able to do things with dexterous with hands. But people still kind of say, oh, you're just being very bullish. This is something that's not going to happen for a long time. It won't have the brains you think it is. It's going to be like FSD. You're going to be the rug pulled under you. You keep thinking it's coming sooner or later. And then people that I've interviewed, like James Dama and Scott Walter, they're saying, you know, there could be some very purpose-built um, jobs that can be replaced, but that our humans are doing today in the factories that Tesla has now that can be replaced with the bots that they've shown now. If, if it doesn't have to walk very far, it can just do one little thing from grabbing something and moving it somewhere else. It can already do that. And then what would that do to the cost and to the efficiency? Now, I know that Tesla already uses industrial robots, and this is just a different version of it with a humanoid. But um, yeah, how do you how do you see all that happen, working in the factory? Well, I, um, I'd like to go way past that question. Mm -hmm. um, so when... People do mob AI. They do this group work with, with, with AI. There's a visceral human reaction. Like the lizard brain is saying, okay, the world changed on me. What do I do? Right. Like crisis of career, crisis of self moment. I've been replaced as a, as a valuable human. And you hear people rant about this on Reddit and um, on Twitter or in, anywhere saying, wow, AI has given me the confidence I need to go back to being a coder or go back to school or to be a doctor because this system has my back. That's the upside. And you have other people saying, what do I send my kids to school to study? <laughs> like, what do I even do? So that's what software assisted basic AI is accomplishing. Um, I, I took 
a, a set of questions that I still had in email or in text messages that people had asked me as an executive. And then that I had asked other executives. So these were thought to be executive level questions. The company would wait for the answer, large companies. And I fed them to both to chat GPT and Google Bard. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, I got better answers than I gave. And in both mm -hmm. cases, I got better answers than I'd ever heard. I mean, the idea of executive wisdom was replaced. That's what Tesla bot is attempting to become, but for physical work. So you have these AI stacks that are growing in capability and already can do some pretty interesting things. If I want a web page built, there's a plugin for that. And I can ask Bard or chat GPT and at least chat GPT can generate that site. And think of how many web development firms are there in the world. Some of them still have a lot of value, but that value is getting marginalized a little bit every second. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, singers and entertainers, uh, y you can enter prompts and get actually a lot of views on Instagram for something that the AI generated. Bit by bit, the ability to entertain humans is something that is prompt based generated um, bit by bit. Well, the Tesla bot play. Yes, there are some positions the bots can already perform and they do. And luckily, there's already a group of bots We're we're seeing as at each Tesla event, more and more and more bots physically present and participating in video of more and more bots at the same time. So we're seeing larger and larger groups and their capabilities grow. But the end game is to be anything I can do with my hands, my back, my neck, my legs. The Tesla bot can do. And when connected with the digital self management and the AI stacks, in more and more types of activity, the bot will be able to learn it quickly and perform it well. And this is the crisis of self, crisis of worth moment that I don't think most people are having yet looking at these prototypes. But I think some people had those moments when they looked at early machine learning systems, early gradient ascent, uh, descent algorithms and said, insurance profilers are done. Yeah. Uh, or, or they said, um, skin lesion identification, image identification mm -hmm. is over or x-ray analysis is, is over, you know, people who saw that early and, it, and these things are, are happening now. Well, Tesla bot is attempting to do that for physical work, like as broad a category as that is. Um, so yes, it will be the dramatic competitive advantage for the company because fundamentally economic markets are allocation of labor. I, I don't think many people think about where currency comes from and and what gives it intrinsic value. Why does the yen have a value? Why does the euro have a value? What's the backing? The backing is not gold. And in some cases, it's not oil. In many cases, it's labor. What you're able to use with that currency's value. The reason a US dollar has the value of a US dollar is partly because of the labor you can manifest into that dollar. And it's even more true in the yen um, and, and arguably even more true in the rupee. That gets replaced. So I'm really glad Elon continues to make a strong play on Doge because at some point there's an intersection <laughs> yeah. between a non-nation managed currency and a automated labor force where otherwise you have economic collapse. Um, you know, you know, like the garden of Eden, Eden happens. And so all economic systems that were built on, um, unfair allocation of, of, of product break, right? Well, what's the good outcome <laughs> have universal basic income of a type of currency that governments can't manipulate to, to try to maintain their fiefdoms. Uh, so this gets, this gets really interesting. Um, the question is when, man, I don't know. I don't know if it's next year or in 50 years. Um, my 
analysis, like everyone else, of watching the Tesla bots ramp in capability is um, we're going to see a progressive growth very similar to the Model 3 production output growth. We're going to see an exponential rise. And once we see bots being produced at more than one location, hmm. you know it's happened. Um, the exponential growth curve has, has happened. Uh, and we're not seeing that yet. And I don't know. Something I'm not sure how many people who haven't been makers, doers, company owners, founders, etc., or at least not recently, um, appreciate is inspiration comes at random times. Um, I, I think the, is it Greek word muse, the, the mm -hmm. angel of inspiration, mm -hmm. the spirit of innovation. I think that's really appropriate. You don't know when it comes. The trick is to be able to execute really fast with really high quality when the muse lands. And we don't know when the muse comes, but I'll say with tactics like digital self-management and mob AI, no budgets, no estimates, the Musk companies act faster when the muse is there than I've seen anywhere and by a large, large margin. And because you have someone in that group, in that flash mob, in that mob, who's automating as the work is done, and one or more people who are doing AI-assisted work or updating the AIs to better assist the work as it emerges, the compounding effect in speed, it's very real. and. I, I think we'll see the Tesla bot future take effect in an exciting timeline. Yeah. Yeah. So I interviewed uh, James Dalma and he talked about how AI is being used everywhere in Tesla. So now that we compare Tesla with other car companies, other companies in general that you were uh, hinting at earlier, you know, what other car company or other company actually does is using AI everywhere. And basically this entire interview, you've talked about how they are doing that and just the way they're structured and they are engineer led, that that's the kind of philosophy and structure that they do. Now you've added, uh, you know, obviously FSD. So you got the revolution to EV, you got the potential opportunity of a robo taxi, which will up upend cars in general. Then you got the bots to produce these products. That will upend. And so, you know, you, you have to have a company that does all three, otherwise it's it doesn't matter, right? So which car companies, which companies in general will survive anything if Tesla is able to do these three things, right? You're, you're taking advantage of AI throughout your company. You've got uh, bots to support you building things. And then you've got this culture uh, that, he, you know, he's already set up. Yeah, it's a very generic, broad question I've asked, but um, just take that wherever you want to take it. Well, the construction capability in the Musk companies, I, I think, is is also underappreciated. How rapidly they're able to physically construct facilities. Uh, there was just a video released, which I liked. It did talk about how much AI is involved and automation is involved in their construction, which I, I appreciated. Mm -hmm. I felt vindicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, look, look, it's not just me. They finally published another video showing how. Mm -hmm. How inherent that is in traditional engineering disciplines. Um, that is actually fundamentally necessary for Tesla and SpaceX's and Neuralink's culture is that they do their own construction. They, they work with plenty of vendors, but they also do their own construction. Um, and because you work on whatever the bottleneck is, whether you think you were hired as a software developer or uh, a Tesla service tech, you very likely could be driving heavy machinery and watching YouTube on how to do stress tests on I-beam welds, right? That actual boots on the ground, the having to go to the bathroom in a plastic porta potty, mm -hmm. the standing in the snow or trying to not get sunburn, that keeps it a real culture more so than I've experienced most places. Um, I, I work now with most of the world's largest agricultural machining manufacturing companies, uh, most of them. And so this is where you think farming, middle Europe, middle America, middle Asia, like the, the hard work. 
I feel like I'm on Wall Street in these companies. It's all sports jackets. It's all Harvard MBAs. No matter where I am in the world, they they cherry pick from select universities that that teach management styles they like. And the distance from the work is terrifying. Um, some of these people might do site visits and and pee in a plastic box, but I mean the the, the lunches that are set out on on linen tablecloths for everybody are yeah. are it's it's different. Um, and uh, in the Musk companies, because they have such phenomenal construction and it's in house, and everyone can and often every oftentimes everyone does participate at one level or another, creates this sense of realism, <laughs> sense of stoicism mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I think is useful to the company's work ethics. Um, I, I, I wanted to add that it's also what the companies are trying to do with construction, what the companies are doing with tunneling through boring and embeddable devices. Uh, no artificial lung, no artificial heart, no embeddable device, human embeddable device has ever grown as fast as Neuralink. Mm -hmm. So once again, whatever the Musk companies are doing is the most rapidly growing company of its type and of another type. So the system continues to keep growing. So you, you said, Herbert, and I loved it, you'd need all three to grow. Well, the Musk companies have all, what, 11? Mm -hmm. um, and mm, I, I'll, I'll try to liken it to email. A lot of us can remember back to paper interoffice mail uh, mm -hmm. and inboxes and outboxes. And then that was replaced by email because it was simply so much quicker. And then many companies have one type of chat or another, Slack or Discord or their own chat. The speed of the Musk companies is like going from paper mail to something past Discord. Uh, they use... In 2020, when I was there, it was iMessage and Signal. Uh, we didn't use Discord or Slack. We hardly ever used email. It was just too slow. Um, if you take digital self-management and replace waiting for a chain of approvals over a few hours or in some companies a few months with a digital self-management stack that answers in a few seconds, like a private GP GPT or whatever you've trained, mm -hmm. the fundamental operational speed of the company is yeah. different. So what's going to happen to all the other companies? The Musk companies are growing these things as fast as they can, not even just using them. What's going to happen to all the other companies? Probably a lot like what happened with email. Yeah. I don't think most companies are going to die, but I, I, I think every company is going to do it once they figure it out and some companies will, 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 will die, but I don't think there was a mass die off when companies switched from paper mail to email to discord or, or, or chat. Um, but they had to go through transformations, digital updating transformations. And then there was a Y2K panic and yeah, okay, that'll happen again with digital self-management and taking on more of what the Musk companies are doing, but I don't think the companies will die. What will happen? Well, that's when you had the rise, of GAFA, FANG, et cetera, companies that got it. And mm -hmm. they're now on this premium class of business. They're the desired places to work, et cetera. I don't think the rest of companies are going to die off, but I think the Musk companies are going to be talked about at an order of magnitude beyond what we thought was cool about Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is cool. It's just the model's been updated and it's now more broad. Um, and it's so accelerating faster and the, faster, right? Yeah. It's, it's compounding. Yeah. Um, One of the things so the you said before. Be my long-term investment pick. Yeah. One of the things you've said before is that uh, this new, this stat that came out recently is that the number one the place the uh, best engineers want to work for is both SpaceX and Tesla, number one and number two. In fact, the, the, the stat was that it's harder to get hired at Tesla than it is to get into Harvard at this point. And so, and then I think you told me this in the last interview, which is think about the NFL, but if they didn't have any rules and all the best draft picks all went to the same company, the same team, <laughs> there's, there's no competition. Uh, you said that as well. So um, in the last several minutes here, let's go back to the stock. I mean, you, 
you made waves very early on. And I credit you for my kind of like building my conviction into Tesla three, four years ago when you talked about the speed of innovation. You, somebody who worked at Tesla, shared very specific things that Tesla does that is really, that separates them. And in that last interview, you clarified that speed of innovation is really the best marker of whether a company will succeed or not. And that's the best company you want to invest in. So that was a new thing that I've never heard before. And I started looking at that uh, part of the part of my evaluation of which companies invest in. Uh, you made also waves because you were saying some pretty very out there uh, stock predictions. Um, you know, just just crazy numbers that at some point you showed the, the Fortune 500 chart and said, you know, many of these industry categories will be replaced by Tesla because Tesla and SpaceX and the Musk companies, they don't just stick in that one company that they're in. Because of speed innovation, they have the right and capability to expand and do other businesses that they <laughs> would never have thought that they should be in. And now they're talking about doing HVAC systems. You know, they they would create, a, you know, they'll create car seats. They'll need to create whatever they need to do. Um, now, are you still, where are you at today with that prediction and that sense? Are you still on track? Do you think that because of what's happened in the last several years since we last spoke that you're still, in fact, you think it's going to be even faster or anything changed? It sure looks like the reason Musk got pushed out of PayPal is mm -hmm. because Musk wanted to have an even larger transformation and not take an earlier payout. Yeah, he wanted and, a bank and they wanted to be uh, person to person email based payments. And he said, no, we should actually replace banks. <laughs> yeah. The, the concept of banking. Um, and other folks said, look, we can make a few hundred million right now. And I can understand that temptation. And I think a lot of uh, investors would wish that for Tesla as well. Um, Musk continues to make bigger plays and, um, Musk has, what Musk has set up in Twitter has the potential to <laughs> be bigger than PayPal would have been replacing banks. Yeah. Um, uh, Twitter to become the everything app part of that. Well, I, actually, I'm near the end of my, of my time box, so I, mm -hmm. I shouldn't start that tirade. <laughs> but um, I'd, I'd say the exchange is, I think the the early sellout moment that would shock the world and be a, a tremendous valuation could happen now, could happen anytime. The, the capabilities the Musk companies have built is so dramatically more epic. Like they could buy out Volkswagen and Toyota and GM right now. Mm -hmm. And I, it would be indirect bed levered buyouts, et cetera. It's not a full cash buy at this point, but they, they could. And the world would go, oh my goodness, Tesla is the biggest car company of all time. That's not the game, right? What that does mean is it delays the moment that most people see it. Um, so my conviction on the overall value is, is even higher, if that's possible, because I was so enthusiastic before. It's, it's even more now um, because of the actions of Twitter. Uh, and... What that does mean is I, I believe I need to let my investments sit a little longer because typical Musk, no, don't sell now. Keep all your chips in the game. Don't take any of your chips out is, is what Musk says, what Musk does uh, and grow as rapidly as you can. And on a very simple level, we can see that by the number of gigafactories growing discussions in India again and production volume growing. So the chips are all in the game, which tells me as an investor, if I want to ride that growth, I want to keep for me all my chips in the game um, because the company could already buy out all the larger players and make the aha moment, but they're not. Instead, they're making a bigger play, um, which I find very exciting. Yeah, they're just making bigger and bigger moves, but it's fun. Right, Joe? That's why we're here. It's <laughs> so much fun. And it's going to be very lucrative, I'm sure. So thank you again, Joe. I know you got to go. So follow Joe on Twitter at Joe Justice. He's, um, he's uh, written a book called Scrum Master. Check that out on Amazon. And uh, he's got his website at abi-agile.com. 
Thank you so much, Joe. Love it that you're back here again with me. Appreciate you. Thank you. My pleasure, Herbert. Have an awesome day. Thank you.